welcome back to Unanimous Descent. The two Sams still here with you from Washington, D.C. So today we're going to switch things up a bit. We have a very special interview guest with us. He's a prolific author and a journalist who has revealed dark government secrets and won a Pulitzer Prize for it. And he writes sharp columns that turn heads whenever they're published. But you might know him best for his amazing dog photos. We now welcome to our show, without any further ado, world-famous dog owner, Glenn Greenwald. Glenn, thanks for coming on. Uh, how are the dogs? They're doing well. Hopefully they'll chime in at some point. Nice, nice. So this is a, a little bit awkward for us. We record the show out of Washington, D.C. Uh, in fact, we record it out of the uh, Sputnik Radio Studios. We have editorial control over this show, but we do I, use... Seriously, you know what that makes you, right? I, I'm, I'm well aware of what it makes us. But I am drinking vodka right now, actually. <laughs> yes. Uh, that goes without saying. <laughs> so, so this show is distributed on our District Sentinel radio channels. It's also distributed on the Sputnik radio uh, channels. So what up to our, our Sputnik listeners and what up to our District Sentinel radio listeners. But your latest article, Glenn, is about Sputnik. In particular, it's about how journalist Kurt Eichenwald has used a story that was misreported by Sputnik to advance a theory that emails released to WikiLeaks have been doctored by the Russian government, Erk Eichenwald's theory has changed a little bit, but he did go on a tweet storm in which he made these accusations that the Podesta emails that WikiLeaks have, have put, put out uh, were doctored by the Russian government in a bid to help Trump win. Zero evidence of that. Anyway, Sam and I, we, we come down to the studio here once a day to record our show. We know some of the Sputnik writers, staff. A lot of them are Americans. We're friendly with them. We also know the weekend writer who made this mistake. And seeing things up close and how they went down, it makes what Eichenwald is saying even more laughable, the accusations he's made. And yet, as you point out, Eichenwald's claims resonated with many reputable mainstream journalists because for some reason, a lot of people want to believe that they're true, that Trump and WikiLeaks are Russian agents trying to crush Hillary Clinton. Why do you think this myth is so powerful right now? Right. So this, if, if the story had only been that Kurt Eichenwald published some hysterical screed and then repeatedly worked himself into this lather about it on Twitter until the point where he was outright lying and basically awarding himself every Pulitzer Prize for the next year because he discovered some nefarious Russian plot, all because, you know, a weekend staffer at Sputnik very understandably misread an email as being from Sidney Blumenthal rather than Sidney Blumenthal simply forwarding an article by to John Podesta, then I would never have even bothered with it. But the fact that so many reasoned and smart and generally careful journalists and other commentators and think tank people got so caught up so instantly in this crazed atmosphere, essentially spreading this idea that he had discovered some nefarious Russian plot that Putin was controlling not just the Trump campaign, but also now the WikiLeaks archive and had inserted forgeries into it, none of which was true. That was what was really disturbing to me. And the reason it was disturbing to me was twofold. One is that it shows that while it shows that uh, that everybody is so eager to elect Hillary Clinton and make sure Donald Trump loses that they've essentially thrown out all journalistic standards, all constraints of truth, all reason, all rationality. And the idea is any tactic that we use, any falsehood we disseminate, any lie that we tell is justified as long as it advances the goal of defeating Trump. But the bigger concern for me was that over the last year, there has been this tactic that has emerged as what I would say is the primary strategy of, of the Democrats and the Clinton campaign, which is to tie not only Donald Trump, but anybody who is adversarial to them or reports critically on them, tying them to the Kremlin and calling them a Putin stooge or an agent of Russia in a way that's obviously very dangerous for clear historical reasons. And it's not only Trump, like I said, they did it to Jill Stein because she had the temerity to run as the Green Party candidate. They did it to WikiLeaks because they've been doing what they've been doing for eight years. Only this time they're publishing documents that reflect on, on WikiLeaks. They've done it to us at The Intercept because we've reported on documents. It's very much this kind of hysterical McCarthyite tactic that anybody that you dislike in politics, anyone you regard as your domestic adversary, should just be accused of being a tool of the Kremlin. And on top of which, they're depicting Moscow and Russia as this kind of grave, almost existential threat for the United States. 
something that Barack Obama, to his credit, repeatedly resisted doing, and which is a very dangerous thing to do because once Clinton wins, which he's almost certain to do, these kinds of tactics will endure and they have very dangerous uh, outcomes. And by the uh, Clinton campaign's focus on this issue, it raises a bunch of questions of what's going to happen, uh, you know, assuming she is going to win. It looks like she's going to win in the rhetoric they've used. But it also is it's sucked a lot of energy out of a lot of uh, other issues. I, I distinctly remember in past elections that Democrats in particular and liberals are out there right around this month talking about real actual efforts to rig the election that GOP uh, official state party officials are engaged in, whether it's just voter ID laws, 14 states have new voter laws about to take effect this election or caging or scrubbing voter rolls. That's not being talked about at all. Instead, a lot of that discussion has been hijacked by this talk of how Vladimir Putin in the Kremlin is hijacking our election. I just wonder, looking forward, what are the consequences beyond just not highlighting issues like actual election rigging this election, but just of using this rhetoric in the future, assuming Clinton is elected? Yeah, I mean, first of all, I do think it's a actually underexamined, damaging aspect of our political system that because presidential elections essentially last for 18 months, almost really two years, I mean, the full on speculation starts right after the midterm election and pretty much dominates the news increasingly over the next two years. It has the effect of blinding the citizenry to pretty much everything else that's taking place, including what the U.S. government under the current president continues to do. For example, just last week, there was this hideous, deliberate strike by Saudi Arabia using U.S. weapons on a funeral in Yemen that killed 140 people and wounded 550 more of the kind that the U.S. has been supporting for two years now or 18 months in Yemen, and it got almost no attention. And as you said, there are things even connected to the election that get no attention because I think one of the things that has happened is so many reporters, especially now, are so devoted to one of the candidates, particularly Hillary Clinton, that they're not actually interested in any news stories that they perceive don't directly help her to win. Anyway, so you know you can't you can't rile up the electorate and the population into believing that Vladimir Putin is this Machiavellian villain, this kind of like supreme evil that he's intent upon almost conquering the U.S., you know, like dictating the outcome of our elections, recruiting domestic agents on U.S. soil, that he's, you know, this unparalleled aggressor in Ukraine and Syria, essentially doing all the things that Barack Obama mocked Mitt Romney for trying to do, which is build up Russia into this geopolitical threat that they simply haven't been for decades without there being consequences. Um, and, you know, people, when the Republicans start demanding that Hillary Clinton retaliate against Russia for things they do in Ukraine or for cyber actions they claim Russia is, is perpetrating, how is she going to have any room at all to resist those calls when she spent a full year or more scaring the shit out of everybody about Vladimir Putin in order to help her political chances. On top of which, you know, the idea that you get branded as an agent of the Kremlin or, you know, a tool of Moscow, if you express political opinions that Democrats or whoever is in power dislike, it's just so ironic that Democrats would be playing this game, given that for decades this was how Democrats were demonized. Um, you know, they would call for detente with Russia or an arms deal with 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 um, with Moscow, or they would call for less confrontation in various parts of the Cold War proxy fights, and they would instantly get accused of being stooges for the Kremlin or of even worse, being agents for the Russian leaders. And the fact that they're so ignorant of that history and are using playing this very dangerous game of demonizing people that way, I think obviously is going to have consequences ongoing. Yeah, it was it was just eight years ago that there was a previous conflict between Russia and Georgia. And President Obama responded to that by saying, you know, we need to press the reset. We need to press the reset button with Russia. And uh, no one seemed to think that he was a uh, some sort of Manchurian candidate. Or, well, I mean, actually, let me take that back. Obviously, some people did question uh, the authenticity of Obama's candidacy, but not on that particular thing vis-a-vis -vis the reset with Russia. But uh, I want to turn to WikiLeaks. A lot of people are questioning how to report on the Podesta emails, the latest releases from WikiLeaks. You know, there are concerns about 
alleged concerns about the authenticity of the email of, of the material who passed it on to WikiLeaks, non newsworthy material being among the cash from people who aren't really that powerful, et cetera, et cetera. This isn't new in the world of journalism, even with allegations of theft. No one serious in journalism would claim that newspapers shouldn't have run stories in the 1970s on domestic FBI espionage based on material stolen from a break in. So uh, how do you think journalists should approach these dumps? You know, ironically, there is no debate among actual real journalists about how to report these documents. Every media outlet in the country is reporting it exactly the same way, which is they're going through the archive. They're finding the documents that they believe are in the public interest to report. And then they're writing stories about them, which is exactly what a journalist would be doing. It would be completely unconscionable, a total abdication of one's journalistic duties if one decided not to report on material that has been made public that is newsworthy in a public interest. No real journalist would do that. And nor is any real journalist questioning the authenticity of these documents, in part because WikiLeaks has essentially a perfect record publishing documents only which are authentic. They've never published an archive filled with forgeries or fakes or anything like that. But also because no Clinton officials are saying either privately or publicly that any of the documents that bear their names are fake. Everyone knows they're real. The only people who are questioning whether or not these materials should be reported or whether the documents are fake are the worst lying hacks. You know, like Joy Reid on MSNBC, who has just repeatedly lied in the most extreme and brazen ways throughout this campaign. Wait, like wait, wait. Demonstrable lies. Sorry, Glenn, um, are you or, saying that MSNBC isn't an official arm of the Clinton campaign? Because that's uh, that's news to us over here. <laughs> it's, you know, it's just, um, you know, it's so funny. There was actually just a story today where there was one of the, there was an email in the archive that the Washington Post found and reported on that very strongly suggested that CNN's Donna Brazil, who is working at CNN as a commentator, got a hold of in advance one of the questions that CNN moderators intended to ask her and Bernie Sanders at a CNN town hall in March. And as a person at CNN, she got a hold of one of these questions and then she gave it to the Clinton campaign, not to the Sanders campaign, just to the Clinton campaign so that the Clinton campaign would be prepared in, in a way that the Sanders campaign wouldn't by knowing one of the important questions that was going to be asked and exactly the wording that was going to be used. So this is the kind of stuff that has been going on that has been such a corrupting force in journalism for the last year among mostly, you know, just sort of like pundits and TV personality types, not actual journalists. So the debate that's taking place, like if you find somebody who's saying maybe this stuff should be reported on, or maybe it's the, the WikiLeaks documents are of questionable authenticity in every single case, or you know, essentially they'll have like I'm with her hashtag in their Twitter bio or you know, tattooed on their forehead or whatever. It's not an actual debate that's taking place in journalism. You know, the one thing I will say is there is a legitimate debate about whether or not the hackers acted properly by sucking up all of John Podesta's emails and whether WikiLeaks acted properly by simply publishing them all indiscriminately without curating them or going through them. That's a totally separate question. Once the document, once the emails are made public, there is no inquiry for journalists beyond are these documents in the public interest? And if so, then I have to report on them. It's interesting the, that Pete, to hear people question the authenticity of the documents. I distinctly remember uh, listening to a congressional hearing uh, last year with James Clapper talking about cyber threats, and he was dropping hints of what we should fear are uh, releases of documents or records that have been doctored or altered. And that was at a time in which we haven't seen anything like that yet before. And here he was kind of messaging that this could happen as though to deflect from future releases if that happened, or maybe because that's part of some U.S. intelligence operations that they run themselves, so they were expecting something like that to be turned uh, back on them. Well, you know, it's two, two really interesting things about that. One is the first time I ever wrote about WikiLeaks, this was before they did any of their famous leaks from Chelsea Manning with collateral damage and the Iraq and Afghanistan war logs and the State Department cables. This was like a year and a half or two years before. There was a report prepared by the U.S. military, by the Pentagon, that declared WikiLeaks a threat to national security. And it talked about ways that they could neutralize or destroy the credibility of WikiLeaks. 
And ironically enough, this report ended up being leaked to WikiLeaks, which published it on its website. And one of the tactics they discussed using was purposely submitting fake documents to WikiLeaks, which would cause WikiLeaks in turn to publish them. And then it would turn out they were fake and that would forever destroy the credibility of WikiLeaks's future publications. So there, that is definitely a tactic on the minds of um, the U.S. military. And the fact that WikiLeaks and all of the hundreds of thousands, millions of pages that they have published has never been found to have published any fraudulent or forger documents or forgeries, I think is a testament to the reliability of their processes. The other thing I would say is the one piece of evidence that there's this, this MSNBC intelligence specialist, Malcolm Nance, who they constantly parade around MSNBC whenever, and then he like says things that are favorable to Democrats. Rachel Maddow loves him. So anyway, he was the one who went on Twitter and he issued what he called an official warning, even though he's not in the government and not official in any way. He decided to call this an official warning. Like what is official about it? It's a tweet from some like partisan hack. But anyway, this official tweet warned that the WikiLeaks archive had been compromised because there were forgeries. And one of the things that he pointed to was this fake Clinton speech that had been doctored and put on the internet. Now, this document was not part of the WikiLeaks archive. It's, no, I mean, pointing to this, this, art, this, this you know, fake doctored art document to call into question the reliability of a WikiLeaks archive is, is, is so stupid because it didn't come from the WikiLeaks archive. But anyway, I think as it, people are pretty close now to proving, and there's some evidence, pretty compelling evidence already to suggest that the person who actually doctored it, or at least was the first one to tweet about it, is a hardcore Hillary Clinton fanatic slash online operative who very well might have done it specifically in order to cast out on the WikiLeaks archive. Um, but here we are, you know, a year, uh, a week later, and not one single email, not one single document has been uh, identified as fake or doctored in any way by any of the Clinton officials who appear in them. We'll be right back with more of our interview with Glenn Greenwald. Welcome back to Unanimous Descent, broadcasting out of the Sputnik Radio Studios in Washington, D.C. We are the District Sentinel. You can find all of our latest reports over at www.districtsentinel.com. And now we pick up where we left off with our interview with journalist Glenn Greenwald. I want to ask a question about Donald Trump and uh, one of a few parts of his campaign where he comes off as more hawkish uh, than Hillary Clinton his rhetoric about the Iran deal contrasts very sharply to the nature of his claims of never supporting the invasion of Iraq from the onset. Claims, by the way, that have been proven false by one of his appearances on the Howard Stern show. Last summer, when President Obama made the case for approving the multilateral Iran deal, approved, of course, by all five permanent members of the U.N. Security Council, Obama said opponents would set us down a unilateral course that would heighten the chance of an Iraq invasion redux. My question is, why do you think Trump has gotten away to a certain extent with portraying himself as an anti-intervention candidate when what he has said time and time again about the Iran deal sounds like it's coming from John McCain or Lindsey Graham? Well, first of all, I think the assumption in your question is that Donald Trump has some cogent foreign policy worldview. And whenever there is an inconsistency, we're supposed to analyze it to find what could have gone wrong. You know, I don't think he has any kind of systematic way of thinking about the world that, you know, would produce consistent positions. But, you know, Rand Paul, when he ran in 2016 and people thought that he might have an actual chance to get the nomination in light of how well his father did in the prior two election cycles, he too was running on an anti-interventionist foreign policy, and yet he had vehemently opposed the Iran deal as insufficiently hawkish toward Iran um, and signed the Tom, Tom Cotton letter. And his father was actually an outspoken proponent of the Iran deal, Ram, Ron Paul. So in that case, it was just clearly a political calculation that given the importance of 
pro-Israel factions in the Republican Party, um, particularly evangelicals, and also APAC-connected uh, money. He felt like he couldn't run uh, in the Republican Party and have any chance if he supported the Iran deal. Why Donald Trump did it, I mean, who knows? You know, he began by saying some pretty interesting things about Israel, including the fact that the U.S. should be totally neutral on the Israel-Palestine question and should not be involved in trying to push it one way or the other because it's not really our business, which is a shocking departure from U.S. orthodoxy on, on that question. And then a mere three months later, he appeared before AIPAC in a speech that was widely believed to have been written by his son-in-law, who is the publisher of the New York Observer and an APAC supporter, in which he just totally towed the APAC line. So it could be a political consideration. It could just be a byproduct of his inconsistency. I mean, this term anti-intervention is sometimes gets distorted as well. I mean, anti-interventionist, to be an anti-interventionist does not mean that you're a pacifist. I would say that anti-interventionist means that you oppose wars unless they are directly in the national interest to fight, meaning someone has attacked you or is about to attack you, then you fight wars and you fight them very aggressively. But that what you don't do is invade other countries to liberate the population or to oust a dictator or things like that. And I think to the extent there's any kind of consistent ideological tradition out of which Trump comes when he talks about foreign policy, it's this kind of like Charles Lindbergh, Buchananite view that because America is supposed to come first, we should never risk our troops' lives or our fortune waging wars in order to help other people. We should only wage wars when absolutely necessary to protect our own people. You mentioned how you know, it, Trump likely doesn't have really a, a cogent uh, approach to, to foreign policy. Neither, well, at least Democrats have struggled to have a cogent approach to portraying Donald Trump as to what he is. You know, he is on one hand, uh, we're told, a, a secret Kremlin operative agent. On the other hand, he is a uh, aloof beauty contestant owner and uh, a real estate mogul who's out of touch. Uh, on the one hand, he's this dangerous extremist fascist that must be stopped at all costs. On the other hand, let's not protest him too much. Uh, I'm thinking of uh, Emmett Renson, who is a guest on our show, who used to write for Vox, who was punished for writing an article on why we should be rioting Trump if he is indeed this neo-fascist. How did Emmett end up at Vox? There must have been something like super broken with the Matrix. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's a good question. We'll have to ask him next, next time he comes on. But given, why do you think the Democratic Party has had such a tough time like presenting an actually rational approach to taking down Trump? And in fact, we saw from the DNC emails, members within the DNC concerned of the Clinton campaign strategy of portraying Trump Trump as this outside figure within the GOP rather than tying him to the GOP to assist down ballot Democrats who are running against Republicans in the Senate and the House. How do you explain this sort of difficulty, which actually probably won't cost Hillary Clinton the election since she's running against Donald Trump, but has kind of shown uh, at least has been pretty, pretty embarrassing for observers who are actually paying attention? So I think that in fairness to the Democrats, which I think, as you know, is one of my leading principles to always be fair to Democrats. Of course, <laughs> they, us we, too. You, you yes, unite, unite know, blue, exactly. Glenn. That's why we're here. We're, we we're uniting. We unite blue. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> um, so, you know, I think that um, in fairness to them, you know, Trump breaks all the molds, all the old playbooks for how you run against Republicans don't work against him. He's a totally unconventional candidate on essentially every single level. If they run against John McCain or Mitt Romney or Bob Dole or, you know, any of those kind of people, they know exactly how to run against them. But Trump isn't like any them in any real way. I mean, he is kind of a byproduct of the Republican culture, but he still is this kind of, you know, singular figure in terms of what defines him. And so it does take a while to figure out how to what's effective against him. And remember, there were, you know, 16 or 17 people running against him, and many of whom were very well funded with a lot of political experience who failed to figure out what worked against him. Granted, that was in a Republican primary, but still, they, they were not ever able to stick anything to him. But, you know, I think that the, the, the real important lesson from this is it really does show the extreme vulnerability of the Democratic Party. Imagine, I mean, I wish I could live in the world where I could see this, where you have a figure that 
has kind of decided to run on the platform that Trump embraced, minus all the like sick, fascist, racist, like overtly insane, you know, like toppings on the cake, like the Muslim ban and the deportation of, you know, deportation forces and all that, like, and let alone all the like sick parts of his personality. But just like imagine a conventional skilled politician running on a platform of criticizing the Democrats for being free traders and globalists, being too close to Wall Street, being too eager and willing to send the U.S. into war, and then also taking a harder line in immigration, which does play well with a big segment of the population, many of whom review that as the first and most important political question. I think that that would be a very potent way to beat the Democrats. And because what defenses would they have? I mean, it's essentially true. They are free traders and globalists. They are responsible for the departure of jobs by the millions from this country because of the deals they sign. They are too close to Wall Street. They do send people to war at the blink of an eye. And so, you know, had you had a figure that was just a little bit sane and a little bit like psychologically healthy running on a similar platform as the one Trump ran on, I think he would have given Democrats huge amounts of problems. And I think you saw that, like when he talked about and stuck to the substantive positions that he was running on, he did well. When he, the, What made him self-destruct was his very broken psyche and personality. Right. We, we talked about that in the, in the previous segment, how uh, Democrats didn't establishment Democrats, I should say, didn't realize realize it at the time a few months ago. But when they nominated Hillary Clinton, they were actually taking a huge risk uh, nominating her, especially what we've seen since uh, she officially uh, secured the nomination. The stories that have come out and uh, the leaks and the emails all containing various, you know, maybe not block best busters, but things that would uh, wound a campaign if indeed it was actually a close race against a competent opponent. Oh, no question about it. I mean, these emails are actually pretty amazing. Of course, they're not getting a lot of attention in part because so many journalists are dedicated to defeating Trump and don't have an interest in stories that don't help to achieve that. And also because, you know, when you have a candidate talking about grabbing women's and like, Supporting, you know, 11 million people from the country, small scale corruption of the kind you see in these emails just doesn't compete with it in terms of shock value. Yeah. Um, but at the same time, you know, and Chris Hayes said this to me today on Twitter, actually, that, you know, if it weren't for the fact that she were running against kind of like Satan's tumor, you know, <laughs> like if she were just running against like just some ordinary Republican these emails would be really damaging because they reinforce all the worst suspicions about her. Yeah. I'm sort of reluctant to lump all the varying groups that backed Bernie as the left quote unquote. Uh, but for the purposes of this question, I'll do it. How do you think that the left that really made the democratic primary, what it was, how do you think they should prepare themselves for 2017? I mean, I think it's absolutely vital that the Democratic Party have a serious force to their left that pushes them and objects to them and impedes them and critiques them in a way that was almost entirely missing from the Obama presidency for reasons that are just complicated and probably too extensive to, to delve into here. But they, they, there was very little of that. There was some, but very little of it. And I think that in this case, there will be a lot more of that primarily because of the way in which this primary, unlike the 2008 primary between Obama and Clinton, this primary, the one in 2016 between Clinton and Sanders, was very ideologically polarizing. There were a lot of ideological differences at stake. And there's a huge number of young people in particular, but Democrats in general, who became very aware of what the Democratic Party has become ideologically and in terms of the loyalties it has to certain factions, and that knowledge is not going to just disappear. It was the reason why she had such a hard time, despite unprecedented advantages, in vanquishing, you know, a 74-year-old socialist that nobody ever took seriously from one of the smallest states in the country. It's because this ideological split was exacerbated and it's not going to go away. And so I may be disappointed. I may be wrong. I actually thought there'd be more pushback against Obama's bad policies and was disappointed in the last, you know, in 2009 and 10, when there were very few of us doing it. But I do actually think that the primary has created this left-wing force that will, at least to some extent, provide more pushback against her than 
than Obama encountered. Well, maybe based on the sort of last two things we talked about, the emails sort of taking backseat to the national nightmare that is our election and this renewed left, maybe there'll be a renewed push of renewed interest in the WikiLeaks emails after November. I, I don't know. I just thought. You know, and one of the most interesting parts of the emails, if you read through them, is the complete contempt in which the Clinton circle holds the left. They talk about Sanders supporters and people who are demanding an increase to $15 in the minimum wage as though they were like Soviet jokes. They plotted like really cynically how to make these naive idiot Sanders supporters believe they were getting things with the convention by making concessions that really were inconsequential, but would trick them into believing they got something significant. Every time they had discussions about how to position themselves, this whole dichotomy between public positions and private positions was so evident in that they were only taking a more left-wing view because they needed to satisfy liberal constituencies. There's an article in 2014, 2014, but in Politico, which for whatever else you want to say about that crappy outlet does have its finger on the pulse, you know, DC power circles. And the title of the article was, Why Does Wall Street Love Clinton, Hillary Clinton? And talked about all the cash that was pouring into her campaign. And they quoted all these Wall Street barons as saying, look, of course, we know that she has to move to the left to win the nomination and engage in all this populist bullshit about, you know, inequality and protecting social programs. But we know that it's not really true. We know that she's really doing it just to win and that at the end of the day, she's going to be solid and reliable. And I think one of the most interesting things that got totally overlooked was when Hank Paulson, the former CEO of Goldman Sachs and George Bush's Treasury Secretary when the economic crisis occurred, he wrote an editorial, an op-ed in the Washington Post endorsing Hillary Clinton and attacking Trump. And what he said in there was the worst quality that Trump has, the thing that makes him, Hank Paulson, the angriest is that Trump, even though he's a businessman, refuses to accept that there needs to be serious cuts to social programs like Social Security and Medicare. Now, he didn't say it, but the only implication of that is that in contrast to Trump, who he hates for that, Clinton, who he was endorsing, supports it. And of course, one of the things that the Wall Street speech has revealed is that she told Goldman Sachs or J.P. Morgan that she thought Simpson Bowles was a really good framework, even though or because it called for cuts to Social Security and Medicare. Well, Glenn, we uh, are fresh out of time. Uh, we have about a dozen more questions here, mostly getting into your dogs, but, you know, they we, we have to we, 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 the whole thing. So we didn't get to any of the good questions. Exactly. And I didn't give you any opportunities to own me on my own radio show yet. So uh, we'll have to do this again. I'm going to come back for that. Yeah, I will definitely come back just for that. Excellent. Uh, Glenn Greenwald, uh, in, investigative journalist, find his writing over at the intercept. Follow him on Twitter at G Greenwald. Thanks so much for coming on. Great to be with you guys. Thanks.